connections earlier on. So many musicians have said in recent years, certainly since he's died, how much of an influence he was on them as songwriters, as musicians. How important was, A, the music of the Partridge family, but secondly, what should David Cassidy's legacy be? Well, here's it's it's an interesting thing. It, it's an interesting thing. The way you put that question, the beginning of that question, or when you said so many musicians have been influenced by his, meaning his music, meaning David Cassidy. That's a big statement right there. Because even though he had, for the, all the stuff on the show, except for, was it Lay It on the Line? Was there Were there any other tracks that he wrote any part of on the records? Do you remember? I should know this. Yes, but. there were. Yeah, I would imagine there were a few, but most of what the people grew up with are these musicians and myself and whoever, you know, who heard these songs or grew up with these things. They were, again, hearing songs that he didn't write, but that shows you how, no matter how much he was put into a box or no matter how much he was told how to do this or that while they were doing the recordings and the arrangements and how much word, how much, uh, input he didn't really have on certain levels, you know, because you hear all the stories about how much of that was a deal or not. The fact that it was, the fact that it was him, no matter what they did to his voice, even the, the ones that they, as a matter of fact, you know what they were talking about, they said sometimes they said they needed to speed him up because, you know, he wanted, he was supposed to be 16 when the show started and he had such a low voice. I'm convinced. I heard brand new me today. It's, I, I just went to the bank. And in that time, I heard Brand New Me. And I'm convinced, I could be wrong about this, that that's the first track they let him sing on a record. And also because it, come on down, off your cloud. It's It sounds to me like it's his real voice and not sped up at all. And I know that there was all different versions of that and pieces of that, you know, throughout the whole Partridge thing. Without him singing it, no matter what they were doing to his voice, because the guy could hold notes, the guy could sing, you know, Without him singing it, and forget the teen idol thing, like I told you, I was was way more into melody, the sound of a voice, and the music and the whole picture it painted for me and the excitement of the melody and, and how it was sung. So if I didn't like a singer, whether live or on record, and I'm still like that kind of today, it's not snobbish, it kind of sounds like it, but if, it, if I don't if it's not exciting to me on some level or it doesn't hit me on some level, or, I mean, I'm all, I'm into some of the heaviest stuff on the planet. I love screaming. Nothing has to be on the note all the time, but when you're singing, it kind of helps if it is on the notes, whatever those notes might be or the style might be. <clears throat> and so that's, I was always super tuned to that kind of stuff. And yeah, Partridge family stuff became David Cassidy stuff is my point in the, in the eyes, ears, and nose, and our perspectives out there, and the people who are kids and getting turned on to music, because I was listening to Beatles at that time, and everything else, you know, and to me, it was always David Cassidy, as much as it was the Partridge family, like, I would think of them as one in the same, musically, as a record that I would hear, you know what I mean, the whole, everything else was kind of like, and here's an interesting thing, too, it's like, Yeah, without him delivering those songs, even like no matter even if it was in a song that that was sped up or wasn't sped up or whatever, or slightly pitch corrected or not, you know, as far as the final product uh, on the records, it didn't matter because he could pull it off. There's something about his phrasing. And I know they were probably telling him here, phrase it, but not. And then you can't tell somebody all that. There's something about the way he phrased the stuff. There's something about the way he sang it. You know, it's funny, and I worshipped almost all of that. The only thing that used to bug me, and still does to this day, and this is just me, I mean, every time I hear is you, when he's, the way he says you a lot, or sings you a lot, yeah, that just used to bug me. I don't know why, because it didn't ruin anything for me. But everything else, I, you know, worshipped, worshipped, worshipped. I mean, like, the way he sings the leads... On, especially when you're getting, like I said, to Up to Date and Sound Magazine. Oh, man. You could have put so many other people in that spot and it never would have worked. No. At least not like it did. And I'm, again, I'm not talking looks, how the person looked. I'm just talking what was hitting me in the ears and, and the gut, you know? 
and the heart. And it was like, it was incredible. And it it's still, I mean, why, why am I cruising around in 2022 <laughs> listening to brand new me? Yeah. And, and, and these, I mean, cause periodically with very regularity, very much regularity, not like every week, but there's always a time when Partridge family stuff starts hitting me. And you know, the stuff post Partridge, yes, it's the irony of ironies, right? My favorite I think my, well, the two, there's two tracks, two David Cassidy post Partridge tracks that are in my pantheon of like fitting right with the other tracks. One is his version of, um, I mean, I like almost all of it. Don't get me wrong, but there's these two that stick out. One is his version of Tomorrow, yeah, the McCartney track from mm-hmm. Wing, from uh, Wildlife, Wildlife. Yeah. and which I think is killer and Lie to Myself. Yeah. Lie to Myself, when I first heard that, I was like, because I got the album when it came out. Boy, there's a David Cassidy fan. Any any of us David Cassidy fans, forget Partridge Family at that point, who would buy like those things when they first came out. That's cool. You know what I mean? It's like, and that song just busted. I, you know, I had never seen the live version he did on what show was that? I just oh. saw it like a month or two ago. Yes, he did it live on the, a number We're, of shows. In, in the yeah, and it had more of the, the yeah. gank and the guitar. Yes. It was a little more in your face, which is, you know, what yes. David was all about. He really, mm. but he was always about rocket. That's why I always like Lay It on the Line. Like Lay It on the Line off yes. Up to Date was always one of my favorite songs. And ironically, it was one that he had co-write on. Mm. You know, like I, like if he had gone, if they'd allowed him to go into the more rock and stuff too, I would have been like, yeah, all over it. Let's go. And he, even the spoken line of doesn't somebody want to be wanted, which he was so against, mm. it still works. It works for the teenage ear. Still it, pulled it off. Because he's a professional. A pro. Yeah, he's a pro. That's what he does. And that, you know, that's another thing. You talk about, yeah, mm. you talk about pro too. The mm. thing that I think bothers me most about someone not getting their due, you know, in the mainstream. I mean, it was funny. A couple of weeks ago, I was going through some stuff. I don't even remember what it was. Partridge Family stuff, David Cassidy stuff. You know, one of my long rabbit holes at night, late at night when I'm on YouTube and going through a million different things. And it's amazing, excuse me, it's amazing how many people talk about Cassidy. I mean, a lot of people love him. We know that. But it's amazing how many people say, you can't act, you can't do this. Are you ready freaking gourd? Mm. The, The show as a kid, but more so as an adult. I mean, I could watch the freaking first three seasons of the Partridge Family now in a marathon. His comic timing when date when when keith partridge let's say but there's a lot of david cassidy in this but when keith partridge you know is can steal the show can steal the moment can steal the spotlight and the sarcasm and the the humor but it's all so well done i don't care what anybody says to me no it, it never seems like danny bonaducci uh dave madden susan day Shirley Jones, and especially David, are not, it, it never seems like they're acting after like the first five, six episodes to me. Yeah. Never. Yeah. But it's incredible, the, the back and forth and the banter between all of them as a family and, and, and all of the super adult humor that you never get as a kid. I mean, man, and they were pulling that stuff off, which I think that might've been cool that they were like David, David's age was what it was then. He wasn't five years younger, you know, because he, I think, I think him and Susan Day to an extent, and they kind of got a lot of that adult humor because you have to, to even Danny yes. Bonaduce, to, to deliver it the right way and, and go at it constantly. The one real constant is, is David Cassidy in that group. I mean, Shirley Jones, we all know what she was and who she, you know, all her accomplishments. But in that show, once it got rolling, you know, people like to say Danny became a character that kind of stole the limelight and all this kind of stuff. I don't know about that, especially if you look, I mean, nothing against Danny. It was killer character. Me and Johnny, the guy who plays drums in That'll Be The Day, we have a Reuben Kincaid joke that runs to this day. And also and also starring Reuben Kincaid from the credits is a t-shirt. I, ha- I must have that. <laughs> but we all know how great they all were, but I swear... If, if the person playing Keith had not been him, had not been David, I don't know if that show breathes beyond season one as the show mm-hmm. and his and wh- what David Cassidy was to that show. We all know the teen idol thing that 
open the door for all the music and the super success and all that. Th- those dudes were fortunate that he ended up with that part. You know what I mean? Because mm. it saved a lot of people at the freaking network and stuff like that. But just as as the actor and comedian in that whole thing, I think, man, he was untouchable. What a great comic actor he was. You know, some of it physical, a lot of physical stuff that he did that people don't even really ever talk about, you know. And when you think about it, they all had, in all those sitcoms back then, people were doing, all, like, in I Dream of Genie and shows like that, they were all doing super physical stuff. In, in the Partridge family, there wasn't tons of that. The closest it really got to that was him. And when he would get a little bit manic and things like, and he would, things would start falling in on Keith and all this, and, and some of the smart ass stuff, oh, it's such great stuff. That, that's, that's the double edged thing. Not only was he, did he hold those musical recordings together and give it an identity, no matter who wrote the stuff, but he also gave the show, I think, its most important ingredient. And even after all these years, I still think that. It's fascinating to hear, hear all this because over here we didn't, well, we did get the Partridge family, but we got it a year right. after you. And it was only on TV for, oh, that's right. uh, what, three months? And then it was taken off. Wow. I, fu- I kind yeah, of it, remember hearing that now. Yeah. But it didn't come back. Wow, wow, wow. late 72 by which time solo work and solo albums you know were selling like hotcakes and going to number one and he was about to right. embark on his first concert tours in early 73 the majority of us probably never saw him as keith partridge we saw him as a solo rock star wow that's trippy that is really trippy i mean that's a huge perspective shift Mm. It's a huge perspective mm. shift because like yeah. being here I, and that, you tell it, I mean, I kind of knew this, but again, I, I had heard things like this fleetingly, but I'd never really talked to, to many people in the UK. By the way, there's in the UK, there is a DJ, former big, you know, I mean, DJ, old school DJ, but he's still out there and still around named Jim Stevens, who is like my UK namesake and back vice versa. <laughs> and we're, we became really good friends. He became a big fan of my stuff and all this stuff. And it's so cool that he's from that school, you know, the 60s, 70s, right. when he started getting into the business and going, and it's Jim Stevens. Like, people see him on the Facebook thing commenting on my stuff, and they think it's me commenting on my stuff to myself. <laughs> but it's so funny. But yeah, it's like, I, I've heard all these different things. I never really looked at it from that perspective. Yeah, because I, you know, here, no one knew anything. And all of a sudden, here's this TV show I'm watching on Friday nights or whatever night it was. I think it was Fridays. Yeah. Little kid, you know, my parents just digging that I'm watching the TV. This, what you were just mentioning about how it was in the UK, mm. makes this really clear, like a really clear thing I can see here. How cool it was in a way. Because again, for me, someone like me, I don't know everybody else who was sitting in the US watching the show. But for me, who was a music freaking fanatic, right? I would suck everything I could get up. But, you know, here we're talking just record. I would go buy records, records, records. My parents would let me, within reason, get whatever I wanted to get. They never worried what I was listening to. You know, I would follow. I would go through their Abbey Road and stuff like that and use pick up stuff that they had around the house. I used to get all those box sets of 50s and 60s stuff, you know, 50s yes. especially. It was like a double whammy in a good way coming to me because I was getting, like I was saying, all the Partridge record and then records. Plus, you know, they put them out so quickly. It was like when Elton John in his heyday would put out two freaking records a year, as a lot of bands did. And we put out like 10 albums in five years or four and a half years. And it's some of his best stuff still to this day, all those records, those Elton records. It was, wow, here's this band. And we knew it, even a little kid. And back then we knew it wasn't a real band all the way, you know, but then you learn later, but you could hear enough of David's mm-hmm. voice to know that it was him singing on this stuff. And and let's face it, I Think I Love You was the thing in this country. It was like, wham! Everybody knew about the, at least the, the name The Partridge Family and then D- DC. But from my perspective, I was buying Beatles stuff. I was buying all the new stuff that was coming out. I mean, I'm talking obscure stuff, mainstream stuff, like later Beatle records as we know what those were like. 
you know, Ram in 71, you know, the McCartney, all mm. this stuff. And to me, the Partridge Family records and songs, especially as I've mentioned to you, I think, with Up to Date as an album, like the first Partridge Family album I enjoy. And it's got some great moments on it. Mm. But Up to Date, when Up to Date came out, it was like, yeah. ah! you know, it was just like, what is this? And that was a whole other thing than the TV. Like watching the show was like a thing you did on Saturday, Friday nights, I think it was. And it was real easy to separate the two. Like since I was a guy, I guess, I, w I could have cared less about David Cassidy as a sex object, right? <laughs> or as a teen heartthrob. Like I, I didn't care. That literally did not matter to me. The cool thing about that is that the music was real easy for me to latch on to and, and be into, you know what I mean? As a separate mm -hmm. entity from the show and the show I just enjoyed, you know, again, I, I couldn't get all the super adult humor, but which there's a lot of, but it was good enough and written enough for kids. And since it had younger kids in it and it was music based, you know, I could still enjoy it. And, and I, and I literally almost, I guess, looked at two things as a separate thing the actual band, so to speak, and the show. You know, and over the years, I became more and more and more just with with the show, just like in awe of the cast and the, and the, the writing, you know, and how the cast all pulls it off so well. And, and it's so adult and done so well. And the records have always been a different thing. And the DC solo stuff always been a different thing to me. That it's kind of weird. And I guess, yeah, you, you got hit almost just I'm not going to say the opposite from that, but a totally different perspective of the way you you became a DC and then Partridge Family fan and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's still all affected me so hardcore and that you you had the more, in a way, the more fun route, you know? This was the real rock star. Yeah, that, see, right, exactly. Because his audience was teenage girls, a lot of people... Yep. didn't feel that yep. he had the credibility to be a rock star because oh exactly audience, is this is that unfair oh yeah oh it's totally unfair from your podcasts some with the people you know who used to work with him and stuff like that it's totally not fair i think it's a, that's such a stupid phenomenon you know that something like that would have that happens you know the key part from what they've said and from what I kind of know is what happens after, you know, who's the management is, whose decisions are being, to, that's what's going to take it in whatever direction it goes, whatever direction that is for each person. Kind of like, you know, it's not right or wrong. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's, but it's definitely not fair. Like I, you, you see that happen to this day. And unfortunately to this day, a lot of the people that actually are big and, and super famous uh, and are just like, eh, because of the internet, you know, that's that's really all there is to them. Back then, before MTV, you know, in general, there there had to be some talent, like if not a lot of talent. You, the singers had to really sing. The dancers kind of had to dance. But you know, and you look at stuff like the Osmond Brothers and Donnie and the Jackson Five and Michael Jackson and all all sorts of different things back then. And the Teen Idols, a lot of them grew up and did okay all the whole way through. You know what I mean? It, it, I'm really, I really think it's the people that surround the person and who is, and, and, you know, we all know what being that famous, that young does to people. It skews your whole, you know, it doesn't, I'm not saying it screws you up, but it screws your whole, everything up, your perspective. You just, it's work, work, work. You know, you're inundated by this, that, the other thing. And it really, really, really depends a lot. I think, and based on what I've heard, you know, and what I've seen, two friends of mine, too, and how well their career has gone as other people in the business who have become stars or whatever, and even some that have become stars. There's always management, especially back then. And when, there were, even when the labels were the thing, there's so little real labels around right now. Like my friend Alex is a lot of different ups and downs, you know. EMI forever and then on his own, then Sony and then and a lot of projects that are genius that are close to coming out that all of a sudden are nowhere. It's like my dad writes books, you know, you, that old thing, you get signed by the old school publishing company and then the guy who was excited about you goes and gets sent somewhere else. And all of a sudden there's a different person out there and they don't care about you anymore. There's all and back then that's the way it was. 
And so, I mean, there's still that, but back then that was really the way it was. And if the point I was going to say earlier about the fact that the, each star, especially if they become a kid star really quick and it engulfs them, no fault of their own, that it's so hard for them to make choices that it, that are going to, this will take care of this down the road. This will take care of that down the road. You'll be able to do this. They'll, you can do all these songs and it'll, you, a lot of times there's no way any human that's been through what they've been through. Ironically, most people think, what do you mean? That's great. But what they've been through, but it's not so much. And you hear stories all the time about how being that famous, that fast for young people is. I'm not going to say wrong because there's the right or wrong is really not such a thing in my book. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But the, it depends on who's around you. As, and, and it's critical, you know, because when you are that big, I would imagine when you are that big phenomenon, the people around you right then and there or super soon afterwards are going to be critical to where you go next and how you're seen and how you're perceived and how, you know, and it, and this, what happened to David happens to tons of people, you know, as far as that thing you get, but it also doesn't happen to some. And I don't think it's really a more talented or less talented thing. You know, it's where you, and it's the fickality, fickle, you know, the fic, that's a word I think I might've just made up, but the fickality of the whole business and in, yeah. in the entertainment business, not just music. You know, the same thing happens to people and kids, especially in movies and TV to this day, you know, that people get pretty damn famous early on. And then, huh? And it's through yeah. really no fault of their own. You really don't see or hear from them again in, and everything in between, every level in between. I mean, I think the fact that, that David was fortunate, I know he was frustrated. I mean, that's it. in all his interviews, you can, he says it and you can tell and you can you know it and understand it. But he, like, did he never get to play the stuff he wanted? You know, in a way he was doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and he was always around. And if he decided he wanted to come back, so to speak, or whatever, you know, whatever level it was lower. And then the way the business morphed over the years he still got to do a lot and be music if he really chose to do it. And he was still, you know, even nearer towards the end, so to speak, because, you know, same old thing, none of us are ever really gone. Uh, he was still out there and he still had a ton of fans and he still had, yeah. <clears throat> and still does all the people that you've told me about that you've talked with and that, you know, <laughs> I mean, and, and tons of people, of all ages are still into him and that show or the music only or any of it. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, and I mean, the guys out there, I'm putting, I'm doing songs that he sang first and people in their twenties are getting turned on to it. And then I'm like, well, this is where it came from for the person. It's definitely going to be frustrating, especially a kid. I'll put quotes around kid, but you know, a kid who yes. all the stuff we were just, I was just talking about who, you get so famous, it's 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 got to be frustrating because you just don't know how to but how to handle it. I'm not going to say express yourself to to mm -hmm. to the people, right? I.e., express yourself to the people around you. I mean, not necessarily mm -hmm. to the world, but to the people around you and the people that can make decisions to say, okay, you know what, just chill back for a sec. Let's mm -hmm. let's rework this. Let's, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And it's so cutthroat. And it's like once some, boom, I mean, let's put it this way: had the guy had no talent. Had he not been what, you know, what this podcast is all about and me mm -hmm. who's giving, who's letting all this connectivity through David Cassidy and the Partridge family and the songs and the show come before I ever knew you, Sarah Hickman mentions me. Sarah's awesome. Sarah's first thing was Partridge family. We, we are, we're yeah. all talking. He's out there and he's people know him. And so how mm -hmm. unfamous is he? Yeah. If you know what I mean, but, but that's hard for, yeah. of course, him to see when you're in the middle of all that after things go along. Cause you, you know, you always want to be the, be famous on your own terms. And for David, I really, we all kind of know that that would have been playing his, his kind of stuff mm -hmm. that would have, and being an actor too, to a different level, he totally could have done it.
it's but again fickle fickle the business you know it's like and after a while how much work or bs do you want to put in too yes did, yeah. did someone like david's correct you know not credit but you got you know you understand i just if it's a hassle it's a hassle and at some point he was probably like so burnt as well as frustrated it's like you know it would become i mean god all the stuff I've been dealing with for the last 10 years, little things become a hassle to me. And in his situation, can you imagine the work it would have taken to, and it could have been done with certain people around him or a different person yeah. believing in him more than maybe one did at the time. It was, you know, pertinent. He, he could have easily. And he kind of did look at all the people. Ultimately he was out there playing with and meeting and the songs and music that he was out there playing. I mean, you know, he got mm -hmm. to go, but yeah, I know what you mean. It's the, the screaming girl thing, the teen idol thing to put quotes around all that, that is you seen as something less. And I don't, yeah. I don't believe that. You mentioned earlier on about lying to myself being favorite, one of two favorite post partridge mm -hmm. songs that he did. When he released lying to myself, that was an attempt to relaunch him in 1990, 91. Right. I remember that. Yep. Was David perhaps a bit too late to the party? Because by that time, the 1980s rock scene with, with Kiss, Poison, had kind of passed by. Was he just that little bit too late? Was no, that's an interesting question. I hate this, but I'm going to say it. I don't hate it, but like literally hate it. Go on. MTV. MTV... I mean, video killed the radio star. Yeah. That's truth, 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 truth. It's it's not it's so ironic, but so true that that was the first bid. Every single thing that happened, I mean, I mean, video killed Queen in the U.S. The I want to break free video. I was here. I saw it. I watched it happen. You know, my favorite band. And you know, anyway, so video and and video started creating tons and tons of untalented superstars it was what kind of video could you make what i mean a lot of them were talented but a lot of them were uh, very untalented and so i think that it wasn't just david it was like donny osmond um because he i always put those two in that same they came around with those albums almost not exactly the same time but close both pretty good records both they could both sing they were both talented they weren't just kid stars, you know what I mean? Like we know that, but but stuff like that. Once once the MTV generation kicked in, and just kind of kind of ruled everything. Even some of the MTV biggies, eventually, some of them, there were only really a handful that were so freaking big that until MTV started shifting away from music and music videos, that, that they were untouchable. But most people. People came and went so fast. It was always about who, like, who was going to be next. Who's the next thing we can throw up there on the vids? And the visuals became more and more and more important, even up till today. You know what I mean? It's like, and so there were a lot of people like Donny Osmond, David Cassidy, a lot of bands, a lot of, um, you know, when you think about that late 80s, early 90s look, yeah. You know, a lot of the people from back in the 70s and see, they had the long mullets, which everyone had. And, you know, not all of them, but some of them. And then they would chant the mullet would go bye bye or the it was all there was it was confusion about what was what. Yes. Like by the time 90 came around and, and MTV had been around for eight years or whatever, or seven or there was even MTV started to get confused about what they were and what they wanted.